We've been discussing the application of finite difference methods to boundary value problems, in particular elliptic partial differential equations. We've been focusing on the Poisson equation as a standard canonical example of an elliptic equation. And in the previous video, we looked at how we could apply direct methods, such as fast Fourier transforms or cyclic reduction, to directly solve those systems of linear algebraic equations. Now we're going to turn our attention to iterative techniques, and this is going to be the focus of the rest of the chapter because of their simplicity and generality in treating both linear and nonlinear problems, as we'll see later in the chapter. So we'll walk through the Jacobi method and gauss seidel in this video, and then we'll look at the successive over relaxation or SOR method in the next video. So we come back to our Poisson equation, exactly as we had before. So partial squared u, partial x squared, plus partial squared v, partial y squared is equal to some known function f of x, y. We use second order accurate central difference approximations for the second derivatives. And we end up with this as our finite difference equation, exactly as we've had before. Remember the delta bar here is just the square of delta x over delta y. We have our 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 unknowns on the left hand side corresponding to our five point finite difference tensor and then all the knowns are put on the right hand side. Sometimes we're going to use this more general notation L operating on U is equal to F. The script L here will be our finite difference operator so that could correspond to the finite difference operator operating on U. Now whereas in direct methods we had a predefined set of steps that we follow, a procedure that we follow, we know exactly how many steps that will lead to the solution. Here in iterative methods, we're going to have a very simple algorithm that we'll do over and over and over again. And every iteration we take, we're going to get a better and better approximation for the actual exact solution. We'll never get it exact. We're going to terminate the iterative process at some point. We'll talk about that. So this is a very different approach to solving these systems of linear algebraic equations. One of the nice things is, whereas in the direct methods, as you saw in the previous video, we had to rethink how we number our grid points in our two-dimensional grid. Here we don't have to do that. We can stick with the two ij indices indicating the x and the y location of each grid point, and there's no confusion about that. We can address it directly in that way. So let's first talk about the Jacobi method. It's the simplest possible way that you could think of devising an iterative technique. We're going to take that finite difference equation for the Poisson equation we had last time with the five unknowns on the left-hand side, and we're simply going to pick the ij point as our only unknown. So it would be an explicit expression that we can use to update the value of uij as we sweep through the grid. So we simply solve for uij. Don't worry about the subscripts yet. We'll talk about that. And that's equal to, we have our ui plus 1j, ui minus 1j, uij plus 1, and the uij minus 1 term, as well as the fij on the right-hand side of the equation. The superscripts indicate the iteration number. So n plus 1 is the current iterate, and n is the previous iterate. So you'll notice on the right-hand side, all of the values of u are taken from the previous iteration, which of course we know. Those values are only approximate. They're not the final solution yet, but that's what we put on the right-hand side in order to evaluate that expression to get a new updated value of uij at the current iteration. Again, sweeping through all of the i and all of the j points within the grid. So the basic procedure is as follows. We start with an initial guess. That'll be uij0. Usually that initial guess isn't very smart. Could be all zeros. It's fine. And we apply that at every point within the grid. Then we relax or iterate by applying this Jacobi equation at every point, sweeping through the grid. And that will lead to successive iterations, u1, u2, u3. So then as we iterate over and over and over again, often hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands of times, we need to test for convergence. We need a way to determine when our iterative convergence process can be terminated, when our solution is close enough to the final solution that we're looking for. So here's a very simple test. It requires very little computational overhead, and it's quite simple but effective test for iterative convergence. The idea is that you take the difference between the previous and the current iterate at each ij point. So you're looking at how much is my approximation changing from one iteration to the next. We divide by something that normalizes it, so that the values of u are very, very large or very, very small. We can account for that by normalizing, dividing by the magnitude of u to normalize them in that way. By taking the maximum of each of these, we ensure that we never divide by zero. As long as the solution is not completely zero, divide by the largest value 
that will perform the normalization that we want, but will never be dividing by zero. And then we check to be sure that that is less than some specified convergence criteria, epsilon. We specify that. It could be 10 to the minus 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, whatever criteria is appropriate for your problem. Obviously, the smaller epsilon is, the more iterations it's going to take for it to reach that level of convergence. Now, it turns out that this Jacobi method, very simple intuitively and very simple to implement, it turns out it, it's very slow. Uh, the iterative process is very, very slow. And so we actually do not use the Jacobi method in practice. We can improve it dramatically using Gauss-Seidel, which I'll talk about later in the video. So we don't actually use Jacobi, but we do use it for comparison with other methods. Not only is it too slow, the other reason why we don't use it is because we need to keep track of all of the values of u at every grid point, ij, at both the current and the previous iteration. So it essentially doubles the storage from what you would like. Of course, you need to store all the values of u at every point in the grid. But for Jacobi, we actually need to store two values for every point, at the current and at the previous iteration. Before we move on to gauss seidel and show how gauss seidel can fix both of these issues, let's look at this from a different point of view to see the convergence properties. The way we do this is we recognize that we're trying to solve a system of linear algebraic equations, a, u, is equal to b. And we're going to split up the coefficient matrix a into two pieces, m1 minus m2. The m1 is going to go with the u on the left-hand side, and m2 is going to go with the u on the right-hand side. Here's, of course, the b. Term on the right-hand side, notice is un, that's at the previous iterate, and on the left-hand side, it's un plus 1, that's at the current n plus first iterate. So part of A goes with the un plus 1, and part goes with the un. If we multiply by the inverse of m1 on both sides, we can isolate the u n plus 1, so it's inverse of m1 times m2. We're going to call that capital M, that's the iteration matrix. That's times the un, which we know from the previous iterate. And then we have the inverse of m1 times b, which of course is known as well. So this we can think of as a matrix form for the iterative Jacobi method. Again, we don't actually do it this way on a computer. This is not the way we program it. But you could think of it as take the previous approximation at the nth iterate, pre-multiply by our iteration matrix M, add the inverse of M1 times B, and that gives us a new approximation, the N plus first approximation of our dependent variable U. The reason why I'm going to write it this way is so we can analyze the convergence properties of this algorithm. Now we're going to take the D, which is the diagonal elements of A, the L, which is the negative of the lower triangular elements of A, and the U, which is the negative of the upper triangular elements of A. And we'll see how in the three methods we're going to present, Jacobi, Gauss, Seidel here, and SOR in the next video, you'll see how different choices of the M1 and M2 involving the D, the L, and the U will give us these matrix representations of these iterative algorithms. So then we have a is now d minus l minus u, all times u is equal to b. Now for the Jacobi method, m1 is simply d. So the part of the coefficient matrix that stays with the n plus first coefficient is just this term with 1. So that's the uij, and that is a coefficient of 1. So those are the diagonal values, so that's going to be m1. And then everything else, l plus u, well that's m2. That goes to the right hand side with the previous iterate. You'll see again, for the other two methods, you'll see different choices of which parts and which pieces of A go in the M1 and go in the M2. But let's just follow this through for Jacobi. So M1 is D, so we have D times UN plus 1 is equal to L plus U quantity times UN plus B. Multiply by the inverse of D on both sides, so we have the inverse of D times the quantity L plus U that is our M1 inverse times M2, which you see here. That is our iteration matrix, capital M. Now, as I've shown in another video, you can do a formal test for convergence. You can prove that an iterative method will converge when the spectral radius of the iteration matrix is less than 1. The spectral radius, remember, that's the largest eigenvalue by magnitude of the matrix. So in other words, all of the eigenvalues of our iteration matrix all have to be less than 1 in order for our iterative method to converge.
All right, so what is rho? Well, let's take delta bar is equal to one. So that would correspond to delta x and delta y being the same, just to simplify our equation. If that's true, and if we have Dirichlet boundary conditions, then you can show that the spectral radius for the Jacobi iteration method is one half times the quantity cosine of pi over cap y plus one plus cosine of pi over cap j plus one. Remember, i is the number of intervals in the x direction, j is the number of intervals in the y direction. If i and j are the same, so you have the same number of points in x and y, then the spectral radius for Jacobi would just be cosine of pi over i plus one. Now if we write this in a Taylor series, when i and j are both very large, then we have that the spectral radius is equal to one minus a half times the square of pi over capital I plus one. And that has to be less than one. So we ask the question, is it? Well, I of course is always positive and it's large. So we have one over a large number, which is small. So we have one minus a small number. So that's always going to be less than one. So that's good. So the iterative Jacobi method will always converge. However, you'll notice that as I gets bigger, the spectral radius gets closer and closer to one. Not only do we want the spectral radius to be less than one, so it converges, we want it to be as much less than one as possible to have the fastest iterative convergence rate. So it has to be less than one for the iterative convergence process to work, but the smaller it is, the faster the convergence, the fewer number of iterations will be required for that convergence to occur. So this is our reference point for the spectral radius. We'll reference back to this when we discuss the Gauss-Seidel method in a moment. Now I just want to remind you, when I use this phrase model problem, what we mean by that is we have the Poisson equation with second order accurate central difference approximations. We have delta x and delta y the same, Dirichlet boundary conditions, and i and j are the same. Now this is obviously a very specific special case, but when I reference the model problem, that's what we're talking about. So if I give a result, that applies for the model problem. It does not apply to other problems. So we'll have to keep that in mind going forward. Okay, so let's discuss the Gauss-Seidel method. Let me remind you of the two problems, the two issues with the Jacobi method. The first is the iterative process is very slow. And the second is that we have to store both the current and the previous iterations for the entire grid. It requires twice as much memory as we would like. The Gauss-Seidel method addresses both of these issues with one simple change. This is the rare case where we can make something better computationally, and there's actually no downside. Usually, when we want to improve computational efficiency, there's some price to pay, there's a downside to that. In this case, there's actually no downside, which is, again, the reason why we don't use the Jacobi method. So it's very simple, the change is very simple. As we're sweeping through the grid, say through i increasing and j increasing, I've shown a portion of the grid right here centered around ij. And what you'll notice is when we get to this ij point, we will have already updated these two values. So we've already updated the ij minus one and the i minus one j points. So why not use those updated values? Jacobi says use all previous values from the nth iterate for all four points surrounding the ij point. Gauss-Seidel says if we've already updated one of those points, use the updated value, and that's the case for these two. That small change is reflected here. So this is exactly the same equation we had before for Jacobi, the one that we used to update uij as we sweep through the grid. But you'll notice now the i minus one j and the ij minus one terms are now at the n plus first iterate reflecting the fact that they've already been updated. In fact, the way we implement this, we don't even have to keep track of the iteration where the values of u come from. We just put the new values of u in the same u array, two-dimensional array, and whenever we pull one out, if it's old, it's old. If it's new, it's new. So that's what I said here. So the uij are all stored in the same array. You just replace the old value with the new value as you update them one by one. So now, in terms of the matrix representation, M1 will be D minus L, and M2 is just the U that's left. So now we have D minus L here, take the inverse of that on both sides, so we have M1 is now the inverse of D minus L times capital U, and so that's our iteration matrix. Remember in the Jacobi case, M1 was simply D. Now it also includes the minus L as well. That changes the spectral radius of our iteration matrix and therefore the convergence properties of the algorithm. And let's see how that is.
It turns out you can prove that for our specific model problem, that can't generalize this, but for our specific model problem, the spectral radius for Gauss-Seidel is equal to the square of the spectral radius for Jacobi. Now remember, the spectral radius is always less than one. You square a number less than one, it gets smaller. So the spectral radius for Gauss-Seidel, for our model problem, is always less than that for Jacobi. The question, of course, is how much less? Well, we have an expression for the spectral radius for Jacobi when the number of points i is very large. That's given here. If you square it, then you have 1 minus the square of pi over capital I plus 1. It's always going to be smaller than 1. That's good. So it's going to converge. But how much smaller than 1? And if you compare this term versus the corresponding term for Jacobi, you'll notice that Gauss-Seidel is twice as fast. So the spectral radius is reduced in such a way this term is twice as big as the corresponding term for Jacobi. So it converges twice as fast. Very simple change. It actually saves on memory, half the memory, and it also doubles the speed. So obviously it's a no-brainer. It's a win-win all the way around. There's no price to pay for switching from Jacobi to Gauss-Seidel. Now remember we talked about diagonal dominance, condition numbers, and so forth. You can show that strong diagonal dominance of the original matrix A is a sufficient condition. Now it's not necessary, but it's a sufficient condition for iterative convergence using Jacobi and Gauss-Seidel. The spectral radius will always be less than 1 if it is strongly diagonally dominant. Now it's not necessary, so what that means is if it is diagonally dominant, it will iteratively converge. If it's not diagonally dominant, it may still converge or it may not, but we can't prove it one way or the other. Now this is something we always have to think about is when we devise these algorithms, we have to think about the computer architecture on which we're going to implement them. If I'm implementing one of these algorithms on a single core, then Gauss-Seidel is the clear winner over Jacobi. However, we're talking about parallel computing architectures. You might actually have some advantages for implementing a Jacobi. That's something we'll talk about in a later video.